Welcome, listeners, to www.ironradio.org, the website and podcast for all things strength sports and sports nutrition. With your hosts, Lonnie Lowry. Remember, Phil is like a gnarled old oak tree held together with scar tissue and bone spurs. Rob Fortney. And I'm telling you, the pain that I would suffer was ex- beyond excruciating. And Phil Stevens. Do it, Rob. You'll kill all those nerves. Thanks for listening. Welcome, Iron Radio listeners. This is Lonnie Lowry. Uh, I'm an exercise physiologist, I'm a licensed nutritionist, and I'm a former competitive bodybuilder. I'm running solo here at the beginning of the show. Phil is uh, somewhere where there's no cell coverage. Uh, Dr. Nelson is at the Paleo FX conference, and we're going to catch up with him after the break. But I wanted to just uh, get through a little bit of the news and mail so it doesn't build up on us. And then so we'll get to break fairly quickly where Mike, again, he's just going to sort of give us tidbits and highlights from all the things he's learning uh, at that convention. Uh, A little bit of mail first. Uh, This is from Karen, always a good source of uh, news, science news. Strength and muscle sport news. Uh, She says, personally, I didn't know there was adipose tissue in bone marrow. Yet another reason to exercise, even if you don't look lean on the outside. Uh, So she got this through Science Daily. It's a great little news catcher. If people aren't familiar, uh, it's entitled, let's see, Another Reason to Exercise, Burning Bone Fat, A Key to Better Bone Health. Uh, It says, for the first time, researchers show that exercising burns the fat found in bone marrow and can improve bone quality. Uh, and, and indeed, in a shorter timeline than usual, right? So here's sort of my little teacher spiel, but bone mass, and a lot of listeners know this, turns over slowly. So I always tell students like master students, don't start a bone density study. You're going to be here for a year and a half minimum, probably at least a year, uh, collecting data. It's not like muscle tissue that turns over in a matter of uh, you know days to weeks sort of thing. Uh, but this, at least this aspect of it, the fat, uh, the fatty marrow in bone or marrow, uh, it does change more rapidly than that. So that's what this um, paper is talking about. They're using CT scans and this sophisticated uh, form of uh, MRI to look at the fat in bone. And I like what they talk about in this uh, in this paper here. Uh, let's see. Uh, this is from the Journal of Bone and Mineral Research, but they actually talk about bone fat as in like uh, some of the epicurean uh, people out there that you know the sort of sophisticated culinary folks uh, they'll do things like spread uh, yellow marrow on toast and things like that that sounds gross to a lot of people but there is fatty content in the marrow of your bones and so like i said if you think about in culinary ways uh you know fancy recipes and whatnot will use that as sort of the crux of the recipe actually but so it should make sense right if it if it's in the animal bones and you're an ingredient in your meal well people have that too anyway journal of bone and mineral research suggests that obese individuals who often have worse bone quality may derive even greater bone health benefits from exercising than their lean counterparts um maya steiner is a md assistant professor of endocrinology and metabolism at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, said, quote, in just a very short period of time, we saw that running was building bone significantly in mice. Now, if you think, oh, Lowry, that's running. Yes, it's true. They gave the the rodents wheels to run on, and, you know, mice will run if given the opportunity. But essentially, they, they made some of the mice fat, and then they compared that to lean mice that did and didn't exercise. So, you know, high fat diets from a very young age make the little rodents fat and then see what the exercise can do to their bone fatness and that sort of thing. Uh, it does say that the kinds of stem cells uh, that um, produce bone and fat in mice are the same uh, kind that produce bone and fat in humans. Um, it talks about how bone and uh, marrow are more dynamic than you might think. Um, marrow in particular are a real hub of activity coordinating the formation of bone and cartilage, uh, churning out blood cells, immune cells, things like that. So they're looking at bone marrow as sort of a a metabolically active tissue, and yet another place that you can actually uh, lose both the size and number of fat cells 
uh, through exercising. And again, this is a rodent study and they're running on a wheel and whatnot, but just to formalize what I'm saying here, it says experiments were done on two groups. One group was fed a normal diet or lean mice and the other received a high fat diet and became obese uh, starting a month after birth. When they were four months old, half of the mice in each group were given a running wheel to use whenever they wanted uh, for the next six weeks. And again, it talks about how mice you know, tend to run when given the opportunity. It says, predictably, the obese mice started with more fat cells and larger fat cells in their bone marrow. After exercising for six weeks, both obese and lean mice showed a significant reduction in the overall size of fat cells in their, in their marrow. Uh, and also a difference in number, a reduced number of fat cells present in the marrow compared, again, to, compared to the ones that were sedentary. So interesting stuff. Uh, you might say, well, that's not going to maybe look better naked or, or whatnot. But uh, when you think about some of the far reaching interconnectedness with your immune system and everything else and metabolic health, that's pretty cool. So thank you, Karen. The only other one that I'm going to share, uh, we have a couple of really good listener questions that I'm going to reserve for next time because I want to talk about them with Phil and Mike um, and John. Uh, but one more, sleep apnea implant therapy. I tweeted about this yesterday, so I wanted to just put this out there. Um, I saw a news clip on television that there's an implantable device. So people that have sleep apnea, right, you go through periods of essentially partial choking in a sense and not breathing and your oxygen levels fall in your bloodstream you start getting background levels of adrenaline and that's not you don't want that when you're sleeping it's going to interfere with the recovery process uh dr nelson i'm sure will talk about sleep after the break some of the things he's learning uh, but um it's apparently twenty thousand dollars and again i'm quoting what i the news bit i saw on on television uh but it's an alternative to CPAP. So a lot of the heavier power lifters or even off-season bodybuilders, right, they get so heavy, uh, many of them end up with sleep apnea. Again, this sort of oxygen deprivation and background, you know, epinephrine rising and sort of, you know, it's a real problem. Because some people are crushed with fatigue during the day. They can't figure out why. Um, I've never personally been diagnosed with it, but I suspect I have some element of that. Now, I've lost probably 15 to 20 pounds in the last six months. So it's maybe a little bit better, but I, I, this seems to be especially true with heavy guys and not just heavy obese people, but even a lot of the heavier power lifters or off season bodybuilders, like I said. So I wanted to just take a look at this a little. It says obstructive sleep apnea uh, is a very serious condition which occurs when the muscles in your airway relax during sleep, causing your airway to narrow or close uh, as you breathe and as a result, depriving your brain of oxygen. Uh, so I don't want to make this an ad. It was just an interesting alternative, like to CPAP. I know Phil had to fool around with a CPAP for a while. Uh, you know, sort of kicks in when you're not breathing, and I, and I've never used one. But my understanding is sort of force some oxygen up your nose. And but a lot of people just can't comply. It's it's not fun to try to sleep with hardware connected to you and things like that. So this implant is supposed to be an alternative to it. Uh, it says fully implantable device called the Aura 6000. It treats obstructive sleep apnea, or OSA, by delivering mild stimulation to the tongue during sleep, reducing or eliminating sleep apnea events. It says think of it like a cardiac pacemaker, except it's for the hypoglossal nerve in the neck. So it'll send pulses uh, to the muscles that are relaxing too much in your throat. So you don't have these you know, episodes of low oxygen and you know, and again, that background epinephrine climb or whatever else is happening during sleep apnea. Uh, a lot of listeners know that sleep apnea has been related to cardiovascular disease and, and that sort of thing as well. And then I, I, there's some quotes on here. I, I don't, again, I don't want to make this an, a commercial. I just want to report on it because I know we have some very large listeners. And um, yeah, this, this Aura 6000 thing could be interesting. There's some pictures of it. It's got a remote. So... It, because it's implanted under your skin and your chest, right, you use this remote control. I mean, God, talk about, like, how people are interfacing with synthetic devices these days. But you turn it on or you could turn it off because, obviously, you don't want this thing going off on you during the day. I mean, a misfire would be terrible. I can imagine, you know, you're kind of twitching in your throat or something. <laughs> I don't know. So you could turn it off or on with this remote. 
Uh, but because there's nothing attached to your head or there's no hoses or anything or a headgear or anything like that, um, may be important. And I, and I think it's wise. And again, I'm, I'm sure Mike's going to talk about sleep, the importance of sleep after the break. But it's a huge deal. You should be sleeping as hard as you train sort of thing. And if you're getting six hours sleep, let's pretend you even get eight where you're laying down for eight hours. But if you're several times an hour, you end up with these, you know, hypoxic events that cause a stress on your body, that's really going to wreak havoc with your health and your training recovery and stuff like that. I don't think we focus on sleep as a huge portion of, of the training lifestyle enough, right? Sure, it gets some lip service, but not as much as nutrition and, and the training itself. So, uh, I, yeah, I just wanted to bring this to everybody's attention. Uh, my wife says she's heard about this. Uh, Kelly said this is not that new. Uh, at least some versions of this, but I just saw it on the news, so I thought I would share. And again, I'm wary sometimes these these news bits, what's presented to you as news on uh, television is actually an ad. I've seen it from behind the scenes where a company will actually pay a network to run their quote-unquote news clip. Uh, and that's sort of insulting, but... And again, that's not my point here, just that if we have listeners that you're crushed with fatigue during the day, especially if you're very heavy... Yeah, or you have sleep apnea, or you're struggling with a CPAP. I don't know. It, it seems interesting to me. So, new technology in that. All right. Having said that, I know that's brief, but we're going to go to break, and we'll chat for 30 or 40 minutes with Dr. Nelson, who's on site at the Paleo FX convention. Hey listeners, this is Dr. Lonnie Lowry. If you've ever had anyone critique you uh, on your protein intake as part of your weightlifting lifestyle, oh, you poor meathead, all that extra protein is going to rot your kidneys or weaken your bones or dehydrate you or give you gout or who knows what. Uh, there is a book available. You could simply Google CRC Press and Lowry. And what I've done is reach out to experts all over the world and create a book, a single compendium that you can hold up and say, this is why I consume extra protein. This can be very valuable when you're um, being quote unquote educated uh, by various professionals on the topic. Uh, there's enormous amount of literature in this book on the safety, uh, the effectiveness, how protein works in cells, the history of protein and weight trainers, uh, much more. So again, please check out CRC Press and Protein and Lowry. You can just Google that, and uh, I do, full disclosure, I do make a small single-digit royalty on the book, but that's not why I did it. I did it so we can all have something, uh, our particular population, uh, to both defend what we do and to inform our nutrition and our eating. Thanks. Iron Radio is, of course, primarily a podcast. But over the years, there have been technical glitches calling for backup streaming and listeners who wanted the convenience of other sources of audio content. Toward this end, Iron Radio is now simulcast and backed up on YouTube. If needed, please search Lawnman07 or Iron Radio from within YouTube. There's not much video, but if you like to listen through YouTube on a Roku or other living room device, there you go. Like your weekly fix of Iron Radio? In addition to being a popular institute on iTunes, we are also on email. Simply go to www.ironradio.org and sign up for the voluntary email. You'll get a once per week email, no more, that's little more than the show notes and a link to the audio. So go for it. <laughs> All right, everyone, we're back. It's Lonnie and Mike. Uh, Mike is on site from the Paleo FX uh, gathering, conference, convention, all of the above. Uh, and he's going to share some tidbits uh, from what he's picking up there. We thought we could share that with everybody else. So, Mike, what do you got? Yeah, so I'm down here at Paleo FX in the wonderful city of Austin, Texas. And 
They're actually changing the name to Health FX, which I think is a little bit more probably describing on what they have going on, since I know a lot of listeners are not necessarily hardcore paleo people per se, and that has some interesting connotations. But they have a really cool mix of uh, practitioners. They've got a lot, a fair amount of actually research scientists uh, that are here. We've got some stuff from uh, Dr. Andy Gelpin, who's a muscle physiologist out of Cal State Fullerton, uh, coming up. Uh, Dr. John Mike was down here. I had to hang out with Lou Schuler, a bunch of other uh, great people from the area. And a couple of the talks that I went to, just to highlight, uh, one of them was uh, one Dr. Andy Gelpin did. Like I said, he's a muscle physiologist research at Cal State in California. And one of the <clears throat> interesting things, if you look in the literature, has been the debate about hypertrophy versus hyperplasia in humans. So as listeners probably already know, hypertrophy is the increasing of the actual fiber diameters themselves. Uh, hyperplasia is the increasing in the physical number of muscle fibers. And there's some <clears throat> interesting animal data. Uh, our friend Dr. Jose Antonio did a lot of that with birds, and he would put a chronic uh, heavy weight on one of their wings and he would dissect some of their muscle fibers out. And he found with uh, chronic wing waiting, so the poor birds kind of walked around with one of their wings kind of down to one side, right. that he actually did see hyperplasia. So he did see the number of fibers increase. But in terms of actual like human studies, there hasn't been much. Uh, Erickson in Histocell 2006 uh, found that in power lifters who were also using exogenous anabolic steroids, that they did see some evidence for hyperplasia. But since then, there hasn't been too much. Uh, so Andy's lab did a super cool study where they uh, got some money from crowdfunding and they were able to get some huh. new technology to look at actually fibers in a super, super high resolution. And what they've seen, and again, it's just a, a couple so far, but it appears that there's some data that the fibers may be splitting um, into two. And when I talked to him, he said there's several other labs that have found something similar in humans. Uh, currently, he said he can't say much about that because they're all um, under review right now. So hopefully later this year, we'll actually have some uh, very cool published data showing that maybe hyperplasia actually occurs in humans. All right, let me ask you this then. Um, how does this play with sort of uh, satellite cells waking up, you know, differentiating quiet cells? And you know how you hear about satellite cells will sort of activate, donate their nucleus to the adjacent muscle fiber, so there's, mm -hmm. there's greater nuclear domain and the cell can be larger. That's not what you're talking. This would be in addition to that, right? Satellite cell activation. Yeah, yeah. This is actually in addition to that. And what he showed was a picture of a fiber actually in the process of splitting into two. Um, yeah, and you're 100% correct. He said that there's um, the, the theory of how you can increase the cellular size, right? So hypertrophy probably limited possibly by satellite cell activation, right? And you've got also got what's called the myonuclear domain theory, which is pretty much accepted now. It's probably one of the limiters for hypertrophy, yeah. maybe hyperplasia, but we don't know much about hyperplasia yet. Uh, so for listeners that you imagine that um, set of our muscle cells are super interesting because they have more than one nucleus. Right on. They're actually, the only cell in the body that actually that happens. So most cells have one nucleus that kind of governs like the, the governor of your state or your city, a certain area. Um, but in muscle cells, you've got multiples of these. And the theory is that you need so much space for each one of the nucleus, right? So a governor can only sort of keep track of maybe one city, definitely not going to be, you know, multiple states of people, that type of thing. So their theory is that if you can increase the number of nucleus first, then in essence, you allow this ratio of the myonuclear domain to stay a little bit more the same. And therefore, you can increase the size of the fiber. 
So it's not really limited by the, the nuclear material at that point. Right. You know, I had seen some data. I actually have a, a book um, where they, I don't remember if it was animals or people, but they administered significant doses of trenbolone, you know, anabolic yeah. steroid, of course, and actually showed an increase in myonuclei, you know, yeah. presumably because of satellite cell activation and, right, and merging and all that sort of stuff. Now, let me also ask you this, because this is something that comes up over the years that I've always been told, I, was it Bill Gonier? There was some early research with the muscle hyperplasia idea. Or I think it was done at OU many years ago. I, I don't remember exactly. I'd have to look it up. But if if there's hyperplasia, it, it, it almost be like fat cell hyperplasia in that we're talking about atrophy and hypertrophy affecting your muscle girth much more. And if hy hyperplasia has anything to do with it, it might be a few percent over m multiple years. Is that fair? Yeah, I asked him about that a little bit, and he said that, you know, we don't know is the answer, but it's probably a relatively small role. But if you look at a lot of the studies that have been done, there hasn't been many people that have even tried to look at hyperplasia. And then it's even less in more advanced athletes, right? So I asked him, I said, okay, if you were to be highly speculative, is there any, you know, thoughts on what type of training may enhance hyperplasia, you know, with the exclusion of drugs. And his answer was, well, it probably the amount of volume you can accumulate over years and possibly variety, right? So doing different things. And so there, it sounds like they're going to try to look at it again and possibly more advanced athletes and see if they can find any evidence there. And then exactly your question if that is confirmed, then the next question is, well, how much of a factor does it play? And you know, pretty much when we look at all the other cells in the body, and this was his argument, that they all do this except muscle cells up until now. So it's not really that surprising that this would happen in muscle cells. We just haven't really seen much direct data of it before. Right, yeah. yeah it, honestly, if you think about it, again, being speculative, Let's say it's 1% a year. Well, I've been training for 35 years now. So yeah. that would be a, a third of all of my muscle mass is because I have more, actually more muscle fibers, right? Mm -hmm. Especially like, and, and again, I don't know how it would play into the, the hyperplastic kind of thing. But with satellite cell activation, I've, I've read that eccentric training, right? Mm -hmm. Contractions really, negatives really help induce that you know, wake up those baby satellite cells and get them fusing with uh, adjacent muscle fibers and all that kind of stuff. So I, I think I would speculate at least, and I'm no expert like he is on this, but maybe eccentric stuff because of that injury kind of response, that micro injury, you know, that might stimulate something there. But Yeah, yeah. We know that anabolic steroids, like you mentioned, do actually increase uh, satellite cell number most likely. And there's been some other speculation with exactly what you said that you know, maybe if someone is a more advanced trainer, maybe that's why anecdotally eccentric stuff seems to help, right? So maybe if you're limited by myonuclear domain theory, you can get more satellite cell activation from the eccentrics, and then you get a better response. Um, my buddy Cal Dietz at the University of Minnesota, he's got uh, the triphasic training system where he'll have people do like a squat. It'll take maybe like two weeks. And they'll do like a slow eccentric with it. So in his mind, he said what they're trying to do is, you know, possibly what we just speculated. And then he's actually trying to get the muscle to remodel, right? So if you do super heavy eccentrics, you've got the actinomycin that stick together. And because of some of the huge amount of force, you actually pop the actinomycin apart. So you're actually causing physical trauma to them. And when they are rebuilt, they're a little bit more mechanically better to end handle the load and then he'll do two weeks of about uh, isometric at the bottom so very long pause at the bottom of your squat and then one to two weeks of a fast concentric so you're taking the phase of a normal squat and you're really subdividing it into a specific function and what he saw was that some of the more athletes he was working with if they put them on a force plate the more elite athletes looked more like a v they could go down pretty fast in the bottom of a squat, they could stop that load really fast, and they could come back up really fast. 
if they were not as advanced, they would come down slower. They'd have this bigger pause at the bottom, and then they would come up slower. So when he initially did the eccentric portion and tested some people, just changing that eccentric portion of the curve allowed them to be faster in the concentric motion, actually. Yeah. No? Cool stuff. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're sort uh, of geeking out. <laughs> Let, that's pretty in-depth. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, and I don't want but listeners useful. to miss some of the other cool stuff. So that's that's very cool, though, especially getting it from the horse's mouth, in a sense, right, to be able to talk to uh, the, the scientists that are doing this stuff. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, he had some other stuff that we don't know that much about. Uh, Slow-twitch fibers actually have more nuclei. Uh, there's some interesting stuff with uh, fiber-type ratio and uh, sort of molecular signals associated to that. Uh, muscle we're finding all the time is much more plastic than we thought, right? So the plasticity, the ability of it to change is much higher than we've we've thought in the, the past. Interesting. And his kind of final concluding statement is that your ability to perform is bound by our cellular and molecular response to stress. So making sure you choose the appropriate stress to apply, uh, which, you know, the lifters listening, that's probably... Nothing new in that radical, but you could expand that into maybe looking at temperature changes, you know, cold plunge versus sauna, you know, maybe I would argue you could expand that to nutrition, maybe fasting versus non-fasting things, you know, things like that. Yeah, it that's all makes sense to me. Yeah. Um, the other guy who I've heard stuff from in the past, then he kind of disappeared for a while, but uh, he had a very good podcast with uh, Tim Ferriss, this show recently, is uh, Art Devaney. He did a PhD, I believe, in economics uh, several years ago, and he's been into health and fitness stuff for quite a while. He's almost 80 years old and performs really well. Doesn't I got to meet him briefly. Uh, doesn't appear to be 80 at all. And he had some interesting things about the process of aging, and his thought is that aging is kind of an accumulation of wounds or kind of damage that the cells are creating, but it's not necessarily like we always think of aging as everything is just kind of getting damaged. But yet if we look at your right bicep, you know, 90 plus percent of that will be replaced in about 90 days. So we know that everything is turning over at a pretty rapid rate. So his argument is that it's the process and the signaling that may be creating maybe misfolded proteins and things of that. So it's not necessarily to worry about the, the damage that has happened. It's sort of these accumulation of these small little what he calls wounds that have been made by the way your cells were programmed to actually make them, which I thought was interesting. Um, he divides stuff up into two phases, uh, growth and then maintain. Uh, so he doesn't like to see too much of a growth phase. So for listeners who we've talked about a lot about this, like growth, if you put a molecular target on it, it's probably just mTOR. It's a whole bunch more other than that, but that's the one he used to simplify it. And then maintaining is FOXO, so F-O-X-O. It's a forkhead protein. And what's interesting is that those are actually related to in insulin. So if insulin is higher, that's more of a growth phase. If insulin is lower, so FOXO will go up, that's more of a maintenance phase. So what he does is he'll have the morning where he'll have you know something to eat, some protein, things of that nature. He'll train in the afternoon using primarily eccentric motions uh, for some of the reasons, as I could speculate, that we talked about. And then he will actually not have any protein or anything after training. His theory is that he's trying to make sure that all the proteins get manufactured correctly, and he's trying to encourage his body to remove, or process called autophagy, the ones that are not made correctly. So he doesn't eat then after training until about six hours later. We'll have some protein and some other things in the evening, and then basically have a fast until his next meal the next day. So what do you think about that? What's your personal opinion on that, then? Yeah, I I thought it was super interesting. And one thing I spent a lot of time thinking about is what is sort of the the trade-off between 
you know, growth versus health, right? So if we take an extreme approach and say, okay, we just want all of our cells and everything to just grow and proliferate as much as possible. Obviously, cancer is unchecked uh, growth. Uh, cancer, a lot of times, is because the um, autophagy process may not be working so well. Uh, cellular, what they call apoptosis, meaning the cells are just sort of pre-programmed to die. That doesn't happen. So you've got these cells that are not really what they should be that just kind of grow unchecked. Right, like a zombie hanging around after they should be gone. <laughs> right, right, right. And we all have kind of precancerous cells, but our body does a really good job of just taking care of them and wiping them out. Um, the flip side is we know from fasting, <clears throat> which I'm a fan of, that the autophagy process is increased. Granted, autophagy is going on all the time, right? Your body's always clearing out these sort of misfolded and shaped proteins and other things that are just not working as well. You know, it's kind of like cleaning your house. Um, but we also know that if when we're fasting, so if I just don't eat for 24 hours on Monday, we know that the growth phase in terms of muscle protein synthesis, um, all of those are downregulated. They're not stimulated at all. Now, we probably don't have a massive amount of muscle loss in one day. It's probably to be debatable. Um, but the approach I kind of do with people that are you know, a little bit more interested in health, especially insulin signaling, trying to make sure their body is still properly able to use fat, is I'll have them do like one fasting period a week of about 19 to 24 hours. So during that time, I'm purposely trying to drive insulin down because you're not eating anything at that time, I'm purposely sort of sacrificing a little bit of growth, right? So if you just label your days as you know, growing or not growing or maintaining, you have kind of Monday, which would be kind of a maintained day, maybe a slide a little backwards, but not much. And then you still have like six days to be in a a positive uh, protein balance, nitrogen balance, things of that nature. You know, this reminds me quite a bit of Phil's usual mantra that elite sport is not 100% about health. Like you're talking right. about like massive growth, you know, the kind of hyperbole you hear all the time, mm -hmm. you know, uh, grow at all cost, you know, and yeah. <laughs> uh, that kind of stuff, it, as opposed to what you're talking about here, which see, it seems more sane uh, but at, at the same time, is, is it the best approach for someone who does have to be as massive as humanly possible because she's in the peak of her powerlifting career or something like, you know what I mean? It's almost like, a, oh, totally. what's your, what's your goal? But I like that health idea. I think especially you and I and Phil, as we age, that starts weighing on you more, right? Like oh yeah. Just the, how do I get, uh, let's say 70 or 80% of the benefits and then get the health benefits out of it too so I don't end up broken metabolically and musculoskeletally and everything else, you know, by the time I'm 50 kind of thing. So, yeah, it, just yeah. Make, it makes sense to me to have sort of those those phases. It, I think it's important for listeners to understand, right, Dr. Nelson, he's sharing the, these concepts and some of this is theoretical and oh, sure. it's good. It's professional opinion and that sort of stuff. But, um yeah, so I don't. I just don't want anybody to say, "Oh, you said this or you said that." Well, no. Listen, this is a conference report, right? So we're <laughs> we're borrowing what we can from it and speculating, telling you we speculate when we speculate. So, yeah, yeah. I get some crazy emails sometimes with people that are like, "So you're saying fasting is anabolic?" I'm like, "No, I'm saying it's <laughs> probably not as catabolic as what we think." You know, again, depending on what you're doing. Um, like you said, we definitely know that it's not the best thing for growth, right? And everybody knows that, right? If you just fast all the time, obviously you're, you're not growing. Um, but yeah, I think the, the older I get and just thinking about these things and even from an insulin signaling standpoint, I've worked with a few people, again, anecdotal, that if you're just jamming in carbohydrates like all the time, and if you're growing a lot and you're you know, going to be an elite athlete and you're training twice a day, you can probably get away with it for quite a while. You're probably going to be fine. But as your activity starts to you know, dip down, if people just start pulling their blood glucose in the morning, you know, I've seen readings you know, 97, 107, you know, 108. You know, they're basically borderline type 2 diabetic. Um, and sleep and stress and kind of pulling back from whatever it was that got you into that position – Right, so sleep more, try to reduce your stress a little bit, maybe slowly work out to going to periods of time without as much carbohydrates and other food coming in. Yeah. 
on seems to help kind of correct the ship before you go completely off course. All right. So, uh, what else do you have? Yeah. So the other one, there's a whole bunch I saw, but, uh, the other one is, uh, my buddy, Dan party. Uh, he's my kind of go-to guy for any questions about sleep research. He's out in San Francisco. He's finishing his PhD in that area. He's got a really cool information on Dan's plan. He's also launching a very cool system called human OS. So you can look for that. And speaking of other podcasts, he's got one called human OS radio. Hmm. So if people really want to go deep down the, the sleep research area, uh, definitely check that out. He had a quote, and I missed uh, who actually said the quote, but it said, if if sleep does not serve a vital function, it's evolution's worst mistake. <laughs> <laughs> so, True, right? Like a third I of your life. That was super good. Gone, right? Yeah, a third of your life. Yeah. Gone. Uh, interesting stuff is that space between the neurons will increase by about 60% during the night. And that this process is primarily removing some of the plaques, especially kind of some of the beta amyloid plaques. And he referred to it as like like a power wash for your brain during sleep. Interesting. Uh, that was something that just came out in science this year. And if I remember correctly, I think that uh, has to do with different uh, astrocytes and sort of the supportive structures in the brain. Right. Now, let me ask then. Uh, yeah. Again, to speculate, because that's the fun part, but mm -hmm. so could there, because there's so little sleep nowadays, like I've heard that college yeah. students sleep 90 minutes less than before, and you know, Alzheimer's is on the rise, you talk about like the amyloid plaques, uh, so this would suggest then that there, there could be a relationship between lack of sleep and the onset of dementia, uh, like rapid aging, yeah. like you don't get the power washing, so to speak, is that, does that sound correct? Yeah, that's some of the other stuff I've seen too that, you know, in, in neurologic diseases, a lot of times you'll have amyloid plaques or what they call tau tangles. You've got these extra proteins that just get kind of built up in the brain and kind of gum up the works. Uh, it's kind of the most accepted theory in that area. There was a interesting study I saw, and I can't remember the authors right now, where they were looking at older uh, humans who were memory champions, I believe. So very good acute uh, brain function. I think they lived into their, their 90s. And they agreed to donate their brain to science when they died. And they did. And I think it was a few of them in the group, I don't remember exactly how many, had massive amounts of tau tangles and beta amyloid plaque, which would infer that they had Alzheimer's or some type of dementia, but yet their memory was really good. Um, so maybe those were just a couple outliers. Maybe there was some goof up in the study or whatever, but it kind of went directly against all the, the other current literature. So I think we're trying to still sort that out. But in the meantime, I, I agree that all the other data we have shows that cognitive performance is definitely enhanced by sleep, uh, both acute and most likely probably chronically too. Uh, he had a, a good quote along that line that said, um, I didn't get the researcher on this, uh, sleep is the price we pay for learning. <laughs> oh, yeah. I thought, that's really good because most listeners have probably noticed this too, that if you have a day where you're you know, really trying to learn things, and I finally paid attention to this more towards my later years in college, not the first eight years, um, <laughs> but if you can just sleep on something, you can usually get more sleep then the whole learning process is better. I'm sure everyone's had the, the thing where you're just learning, you're taking in a ton of new data that day. You may not even be moving around that much and you just feel like super tired, right? Uh, what else do I got here? Uh, he talked about for uh, sleep timing, intensity, and duration, uh, which is, I, I love that because it's very similar to training. Yeah. Right? You can even extend that into nutrition, so I always like when principles show up in, in multiple domains. Well, we did a whole episode on that once. Yeah, the, it, uh, not with sleep. I like the idea with sleep, though. But, yeah, we've had some athletes on, right? That they're Specifically, they're like, I want to sleep as hard as I train. You know, that kind of idea. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I also think about the ability to do what I call sort of hard or fast transitions, right? So if you're an athlete, can you, in theory, do less warm-up and get to your max sooner? Right. Again, being safe. Don't be a numb nuts about it. 
Um, can you take an object from not moving to moving fast, right? And the faster you can do that, right? So rate of force development, velocity, even just looking at a 100 meter sprinter. And then with intensity, the same thing, can you do those transitions between being awake, being very productive, and then boom, being asleep, right? You don't really wanna take three hours to try to transition from that. I think that's probably a movement in a better direction. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, how do we assess fitness level with the, some of these cardio type, you know, um, VO2 max uh, estimation tests like heart rate recovery, you know, mm -hmm. jump up and down on bleachers and then let's see the quicker yep. your heart rate returns to rest, the more fit you are, you know. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, light in the eye works as an anchor for your sleep wake cycle. And we've, known about this for a while but it's one thing i do with clients too is you know get up in the morning and just go for a walk or try to eat lunch outside all these tips i actually got from dan he said average about 30 minutes outside every day and that's helping to kind of anchor that sleep wake cycle so that it doesn't drift and if you want to take people and you really want to mess up their circadian rhythm uh several years ago when i met him he was telling me about a study they did in antarctica these researchers would be inside pretty much all the time, especially when it's super dark all the time. And they would play around with, they control the lighting. So I think they did a two weeks on, two weeks off. And what they found was that if they didn't have any natural light exposure at all, their whole um, sleep-wake cycle would just kind of drift. And what you see is people tend to not get tired in the evening when they should, or they'll all of a sudden feel more tired in the afternoon, they just don't have these nice periods of being awake during the day and being sleepy at night. Um, related to obesity, this quote was really interesting. I said, uh, if you sleep less than six hours a night, your risk of obesity goes up by 55%. Oh. Which is crazy. Uh, in a study on that, they had compared, uh, this is from Jose Broussard, uh, four days at four and a half hours of sleep, and then four days at eight hours sleep. And they were looking at insulin. And so in the normal group that got enough sleep, it was about 0.25 of insulin. They got a nice response in clearing glucose and all the wonderful things we know about. In the group that was sleeping four and a half hours after four days, it took five times the amount of insulin, but what was really striking is that even at that five time amount where they maxed out, it was only 60% as effective. So hmm. this tells you that indirectly the tissues are becoming massively insulin resistant in a super short period of time. Huh. They had uh, another study from uh, University of Chicago, if I remember right, Eve von Cotter. So three and a half, just under four hours of sleep, so three hours, 15 minutes of sleep versus nine hours of sleep. And they showed a 40% drop in glucose clearance. And after uh, six days, they were pre-diabetic in terms of their oh, ability man. to clear glucose. Yeah. yeah. And I remember that study was actually, it was, it's actually an older study. And they actually used, if I remember correctly, healthy college-age people. <laughs> oh, man. You know, so often we overlook, you hear about the term recovery so mm -hmm. much in bodybuilding and powerlifting. And usually it's with reference to, you know, putting fuels back because of the depletion or dealing with the inflammation. Or people just tend to blow off the sleep. It, to me, it's almost like... A, you know how they call hypertension or even diabetes silent killers because you, it doesn't hurt yeah. while it's happening. So, I mean, yeah, you're foggy the next day, but we have such a proliferation of energy drinks and coffee and everything else that you're – like this is one-third of the picture. If it's like train, eat, sleep, well, yeah, I don't think there's been uh, nearly – equal attention on on the sleep side of things you know there's some peripheral stuff like we talked when we were talking about yorn uh, a couple of weeks ago about um taking advantage of that period to get some nutrients in mm -hmm. that sort of thing but but sleep itself like what's the like the physiology of sleep uh i don't know maybe it's not enough of a reader hook to really excite people but you don't see it in fitness magazines and we really should i think we should be more what you were just talking about the massive degree of insulin resistance 
oh my god like how are you going to get glycogen deposition and and you know be able to recover your muscles so you can train again when you're running on four hours sleep every night and just trying to correct it by dumping caffeine on it you know oh yeah yeah and we're, we're definitely seeing more talk about it in the fitness space i know uh, dr kurt parsley is here he's got some great stuff in addition to dan party and other uh, people are talking about it and i mean i know when i was finishing my my phd i knew I was purposely kind of running low on sleep. And as I was finishing it, I started getting curious. So I started measuring my blood glucose in the morning. And I was easily in the hundreds most of the time. I'm like, oh, crap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yep. And then after I graduated, I literally, my first thing was I'm just going to move my whole schedule so I can sleep as much as possible. And granted, I had a massive sleep debt and some other issues going on. Um, but I was sleeping 10 to 11 hours a night for freaking months. And the good part is my blood glucose did normalize after a while. And then I would go through periods where uh, if my HRV would go up, so I would be uh, more stressed. Technically, the HRV number goes down. But HRV would show that I'm more stressed and sleep was less. For a while, my blood glucose would definitely spike up again. And, you know, it's anecdotal, but what I noticed is if I wasn't in as much of a sleep debt, uh, the rest of the stuff was pretty good. You know, I could then go for one or two nights, especially being out somewhere like here. And it was okay. It wasn't that horrible. But I think it's the, like anything, right? So if you're overtrained or overreached or it's the, the chronic accumulation of these things and your poor body is just doing the, the best that it can. You know, it's like, hey, if I... This is what you left me with. If I got a whack insulin level super high to try to get this blood glucose out of here, that's, you know, what I'm going to do. And then that's going to come at a, a cost from somewhere. Yep. Yeah. So uh, a couple, couple other tips to wrap up here. Uh, use night shift on your phone. So that'll make the blue light. You can take that more out of the screen. Uh, listeners are probably familiar with a program called Flux. F dot L U X. Yep. Use it myself. Yeah. Super useful. Uh, a couple other things that I haven't had a chance to look into too much that he mentioned, uh, something called the Lumos L U M O S that looks like something that may be able to dramatically cut down on jet lag. Um, he was saying that it may be able to cut your jet lag time by two thirds even. Um, and it looks like it's some light timing in the eye. I uh, haven't had a chance to talk to him much about it. I'll, I'll talk to him today. Another interesting one was called the Human Charger. And it's a blue or white light, I think, that gets put into your ear canal. So I guess there's some phototype receptors in your ear canal that are related to sleep-wake cycles. Really? Hmm. Yeah. And I haven't had a chance to, to check that out much yet, but it sounds kind of fascinating. That sounds like something you'd hear in some type of... Uh animal with senses that beyond what people yeah. have you know not in people wow yeah and then the last one was and i don't know if this product's even out yet or what exactly it is called deep wave and it sounds like it's doing something to he said enhance slow wave sleep may help with memory retention and i believe it was using some type of bioral beats or some type of uh sound that was somehow gated to measuring your sleep cycle. I'm not sure exactly how that works yet, but it was a feedback type system. So it'll kind of look for, you know, what cycle you're in and try to, it sounds like, change some of the, the sounds to, you know, try to enhance maybe certain parts of the sleep patterns. So Oh, interesting. Oh, like monitoring and change on the fly, like give you the support that you need somehow. Yeah, kind of like a biofeedback type yeah, system. Yeah, right. You know, yeah. where it's, looking for this type of sleep cycle and then trying to, to bump up maybe certain areas. So, uh, yeah, so it was super fascinating, uh, talk. There's you know, a bunch of other stuff here. I'll probably do the, the arcs fit today, which is a super heavy, uh, eccentric. So imagine if you were doing like a leg press, but you put the leg press on a super strong motor so you can control how far it goes you can control distance so you're pushing against this object that's kind of coming down closer to you 
So you can do highly controlled eccentric, concentric. And what's really cool is they put uh, like strain gauges and sensors in it. So they'll constantly live measure the feedback and how hard you're actually pushing against it. Um, so very interesting, especially I've, I've talked to them a bunch of times each year. I've been down here and uh, they've used it more for kind of rehab populations now too, right? So you can imagine if you're ACL post replacement, they can program it to, okay, we want this, you know, displacement down to a couple millimeters and then, you know, increase that maybe just distance that's traveling over time or emphasize eccentrics. And yeah, so that was also very fascinating. Yeah, the ability to manipulate portions of a rep, it's, yeah. it just goes beyond what a lot of people think. And uh, I mean, even I have the equipment to be able to do that. So it's not like it, it's extremely uh, – now, not that equipment that you're talking about. But again, the ability to look at things like earlier you're, you're talking about abruptly coming to a stop or exploding out of the mm -hmm. hole or looking at things like rate of force development or time to peak power or, you know, it, it's it's – cool to look at these different things you take that specificity principle of exercise you know and you can really kind of zero in on specific weaknesses maybe in, in your your strength pattern or, or or whatever so it's that's cool stuff yeah yeah especially with the stuff you guys have been doing there with the measurement system you have and the caffeine and everything well yeah i mean gosh just one manipulation but think of all the different things that you can do with uh well, like you're talking about, like emphasizing oh, yeah. heavy, heavy eccentrics and, uh, you know, just breaking down uh, the full rep cycle into, I don't know, very specific parts and see where maybe you're lacking or where a nutrition intervention can come into play. It, it, it's fun stuff. I mean, a lot of people might say, well, you know, you're this is analysis paralysis. It's like, well, maybe, but... Uh, you thinking like a scientist, right? If, if you can make everything into a variable, you should be able to find out what's s stopping your progress, I guess, or, you know, that sort of thing. So, Yeah, and last comment on that, I think getting live data to allow you to change your output is very useful. I know we had Dr. Brian Mann on here before talking about velocity-based training, and I've used the, the push system. There's other systems out there, but... It'll give you on through your smartphone now a uh, live measurement. So if I'm just doing power cleans and I'm not very good at doing Olympic lifts at all, but I could see, oh, so as soon as I set the bar down, okay, here's your speed. Oh, oh uh, that's quite a bit off from the previous rep. So then I'll give myself basically one more rep to see if I can get that speed back. And if I can, then I know it was probably a, a learning or maybe more of a technique-based type thing. So I'd have to check on the studies on this, but I would hazard a guess that if you can get live feedback during a session, your performance will just go up because you're competing with yourself, right? So if you see your max force on the first rep and then the next rep you see is a little lower, eh, you kind of know maybe you did slack off a little bit there, right? So maybe you can see if you can bump that up on the next rep. Right. And at some point, you're just not able to do it at all, so you're done. You know, you've gotten the response that you want in the system. Were you on the show the, the day that we had MC on? You remember MC Powers? Um, yeah, yeah. It, I missed the last one, but the previous ones I but was. she was talking about how they use that at the university, you know, the, the yeah. university, specifically for... Uh, whether it's inter or intra, but sort of that, yeah, that competition because you have now you have a number to chase, you know, mm -hmm. sort of thing. It's it's a cool concept. Yeah, cool. Yeah, but uh, overall it was super fun. So if listeners are interested in that kind of stuff. I'm sure they'll have the conference again next year. So I'd, I'd definitely recommend that they check it out. And uh, I just did a quick talk on five ways to increase the use of fat as a fuel. Maybe we can talk about that at some other point or whatever. Sure. And then uh, strength and conditioning panel that was good too. Talking about some of the concepts we talked about here with uh, hypertrophy. So yeah, it's a good time. Good stuff. Now, just before I let you go, um, how big is it? Like how many people? Roughly, how much yeah. does it cost? Things like that. It's pretty big. I'm not sure the exact cost. I know it's probably I think several hundred for three days. Um, but if you're trying to get a hold of people or watch presentations, I believe right now there's six stages that are going on like simultaneously. 
Um, so there's yeah, tons of presenters. I mean, all the, the big names in the paleo world of Rob Wolf, Mark Sisson, and all the other guys are here. And it's pretty nice that most of the people are just kind of wandering around most of the time, you know, so you can just run in and go up and say hi. Um, but yeah, it's, it's good. There's a lot of nutrition stuff. There's are there hundreds stuff. or thousands there's, of people? Like I literally oh, yeah. don't know. I th- I don't know what the exact attendance is this year, but I think it averages around at least 3,000 people that attend. Okay. Yeah, so it's pretty good sized. Right on. Good stuff. Yeah, they have the whole Palmer Event Center here, so they've got the whole place rented out just for this. Right on. Yeah. Cool stuff. Cool stuff. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, we've been able to do some uh, fun on-site stuff. You're sort of like the uh, roving reporter because <laughs> you're reporter, always, yes. always traveling. So that's good uh, stuff. I think it's one of the best things about podcasting. I say it all the time. And, uh, I'll leave everybody with this, but being able to bring you stuff because, while it's fresh, right? Like you oh, can totally. speculate on this stuff, and you're thinking, like you even mentioned earlier, you're thinking about it. You go back to your hotel room, or you have a discussion over dinner, and you can share that stuff before it just sort of evaporates into the ether. You know, so podcasting yeah. can bring that kind of stuff. I, I love that stuff. So. Yeah, and especially because you're talking to the actual researchers and, you know, everybody knows how long it takes that stuff to get published, you know, right? So they can say, hey, you know, here's what we're kind of investigating now. Here's what we think may happen. You know, the study may be ongoing or just starting or wherever stage it's at. And, you know, even if the data is all done and in, you know, you may not even see that show up in the literature for one, two, maybe even three years, depending on where it's submitted, the review process, oh, maybe right. they need some more data, and that's a, it's a long friggin' time. <laughs> yeah, conferences are like a time machine. I agree with that 100%. Yeah. Now, having said that, and I, I don't want to keep dragging this on, I know you have to go, but th- when you speak to the real researchers, it's so different from the fitness industry because a real scientist oh, constantly, clearly. she or he, will talk in uh, caveats well, this is speculation, or, well, we can't say that yet, and that's not what you hear in the general the fitness industry with the gurus, you know, like, oh, testosterone's the reason you're not getting huge, and eat saturated fat, now you're going to look like the cover <laughs> of a magazine, and, you know, as it, it's almost bizarre sometimes, these partial truths that they get commercialized, and when you talk to the mm-hmm. real researchers, they're so reductionist. They're like, well, we don't know that one yet. That that would be their next step. And it's more sober. And on, I think smart people appreciate the the more sober, cautious approach more than all the hyperbole that seems, you know, fitness is just so bad with the nutrition and exercise gurus and the exaggeration and hyperbole. So when you go to these sessions, I mean, at least Mike will tell us, this is how I feel about it, you know, or yeah. this was my take, or here's how we're going to bastardize this a little and apply it to lifters because it all, doesn't always necessarily. Um, yeah, and that's the fun part, right? As long as you, when you speculate, you say, I'm speculating now, you know, and you don't usually get that in so much of the fitness world, so. Yeah, and the nice part on that too is that most of the stuff that we're speculating on, people can usually do and apply, and two, it's pretty darn safe you know we're talking about exercise here we're not talking about weird experimental drugs and you know we have got a pretty good foundation of what's going to happen and maybe we don't get the result that we speculated on but the the downside isn't really super high either and there's probably some benefit and maybe we got the mechanism wrong so maybe you get the result but maybe as to why you got the result we weren't really right on but I'd say a vast majority of the people care more about the result than they do with all the mechanistic stuff. It's just mechanistic stuff to me is a better way of understanding the process. So therefore, maybe we can apply that in a slightly different way to get maybe even a better result. You know, and it kind of goes back and forth between those. You're such an engineer. I know I am. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, everyone. Uh, we'll, uh, cool. yeah, we'll call it there and we'll catch up with you next week. All right, see you guys. Hey, listeners. Have you seen the store at ironradio.org? There are three halls in the store, one for Phil, one for Fortress, and one for myself, Dr. Lowry, and they're thematic. So you can go into our Halls of Iron store and choose based on 
your goal. If you need something to learn or read or something nutritional, you can look in my store, uh, Lonnie's store. If you want something about injury prevention uh, or competition, then take a look at Phil's Hall of Iron. And if you want something about motivation or daily training, Fortress's Hall has what you're looking for. There are some fun, heroic descriptors uh, as you browse through the stores. We try to make it a little more fun than the average boring online store. And whether you're a novice lifter or someone more experienced, you can take heart that you're not wasting your time. The things that we put in each hall of iron are actually based on our own recommendations. Protein powders that we know to be good, uh, knee sleeves, wraps of some kind, things that Fortress uses in his own training. Uh, the stuff you, you see, you know is good. This way you don't waste time. So check out the Iron Radio store at ironradio.org. And um, let us know what you think on the forums. And certainly you can request products and we will uh, screen them before they go in. So thanks for listening. Iron Radio is accepting donations. If you like what we do, the professors, the scientists, the bodybuilding show promoters, the athletes themselves in powerlifting and bodybuilding, um, please consider making a donation or maybe buying something from the ironradio.org uh, store. Uh, we also are accepting supporting members. So for $4 a month, which is frankly less than the bank sneaks out of your account in fees, you can step up and support a form of sort of public radio for the bodybuilding and powerlifting and strength community. The Iron Radio Podcast and all of the audio on ironradio.org is for informational purposes only. If you're interested in starting a diet or exercise program, it's important to check with your physician. Also seek the help of registered dietitians, athletic trainers, and qualified exercise physiologists in order to make the progress that you need.